Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, it's a holiday weekend coming up, and you all are very lucky because this is a very short chapter. Anyone read it? I still was trying to get you module two. <laughs> well, <laughs> next, week, next week you'll be on module four. <laughs> so you better, you better start reading and reading fast. Mm. Okay, so let's do tonight the different types of mortgages. So we know um, all law books always say that there's a misconception that the person goes to a bank to get a mortgage. Everybody always say, I'm going to get a mortgage. But they say, really what you should say is that the borrower does not get a mortgage, but rather mm -hmm. he gives a mortgage to the bank. Oh, the That's the correct way of saying it. What you actually get is you get money from the bank, a loan. The loan is called a mortgage loan. And the mortgage itself is the security for the borrower who gives for repayment of that loan. So in law, what the borrower does is he gives a mortgage to the financial institution. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So when the borrower gives the mortgage to the financial institution, that property is a security. And the security has two functions. One, it provides the um, borrower the incentive to repay because of course he wants to get his security back. And two, if the borrower fails to repay, then of course the lender has something to sell. So it's a win-win on each side, as long as the borrower pays, he'll get his property back. If he doesn't pay, but then of course the bank will get will sell the property. So what, what exactly is a mortgage? A mortgage can be termed as a conveyancing of land for the payment of a debt or discharge of some other obligation for which it is given. That's one definition of a mortgage. Another definition is a mortgage is an interest in property created as a form of security for a loan or created as security as payment of a debt and is terminated on payment of the loan or on payment of the debt. So the borrower gives ownership as security. You understand that, right? Because once there is a conveyancing of the property, the borrower gives his legal interest to the bank. That's what he is conveying. He retains his possession. Right. So that means he can stay in the house if he wants to, or he can rent it, but he still has possession. Ownership is transferred subject to reconveyance or redemption. So the borrower who grants the mortgage is called the mortgage or, and the lender who provides the money for the loan it's called the mortgagee. So there are different types of mortgages. One is a legal mortgage. So this is where the borrower will convey, or they say confer their legal interest on the lender, the bank, the mortgagee. And normally you have to have a legal estate in the land in order to transfer. So you're either transferring the fee simple absolute or you're transferring your lease. 
Remember always with a legal mortgage, it gives a better security. The next type of mortgage is an equitable mortgage and an equitable mortgage can be twofold. It could be one where a person has a life interest. You understand what, what it means when they say someone has a life interest in a property? No. As long as, as long as they're alive, I mean, until the death? Yes. So this normally happens when someone um, in their will, they would have written in the will that um, Mary can stay in the house until their death. Upon their death, it's to be transferred to my children. So that means that Mary has a life interest. That life interest is an is a, is a, is a equitable interest. So that person can confer the equitable interest on, on the mortgagee. Now you can also have it um, granted whereby you have someone who is a beneficiary of a trust and they can actually confer their equitable interests in, the, in one of the assets of the trust. Normally you use an equitable interest for short term. You all know that mortgages are for long term, too long in my eyes, 20, 25 years is long. You can also have an equitable charge. And this really gives an equitable interest on the chargee, but with more limited rights than an equitable mortgage. So let me ask you, what's the difference between an equitable charge and a legal mortgage? What do you think is the difference between the two? One is more restrictive. Yes. I guess in terms of what you can do, Mm -hmm. The next thing, think about it now. The next thing is a mortgage is normally on immovable property. A charge could be on movable or immovable. A mortgage is normally for a fixed payment period. A charge may be for whatever period. And we know the mortgage is an agreement between two, two parties. Is that a scenario in which, say for instance, um, I have, say, a piece of land, but I want to get a mortgage for another, another piece of property. And I say, well, okay, I'll use this land to put up, say, 20000 in order for me to get to buy this home. Is it something like that? And I would say, well, upon, I guess, completion of 20000 once I pay 20000 down off this mortgage, then you release this property back to me or convey it back to me? Is that what an echo? Oh, I, I think it's too complicated. No, that's too complicated. <laughs> that's too complicated. <laughs> okay. The persons in, 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 in the class who actually do mortgages to tell you, I don't think banks do that. Not the ones here in Nassau. They don't like anything complicated. They just mm -hmm. want a straight mortgage. That's true. Yeah. Agree. You agree, right? That's yeah, that's yeah. I, I noticed they I noticed even though the commercial banks and their corporate section like to offer um, loans to to companies, but they're very particular on the type 
of loans that they grant. They're very particular. They don't like to give charges. So don't forget now, charges could be over, you could do a charge over your assets, which are movable. And then you can so, pledge those assets. So the charge does not have, it doesn't have to be land, is what you're saying? It could be over anything that, like you said, it's movable and that has value, basically. Yeah, uh-huh. But in those instances, um, they're not that, what, what is the legal aspect of that? Like, uh, are those items still recorded? Do they have still have to be registered? You mean the charge? Yes. But don't forget now the asset is movable. So what are you registering? Because it's not like when you have a mortgage and you're actually registering a piece of land. Now, from my experience, right, we mm -hmm. um, there there's something called a chattel mortgage. What we do, what um the banks sometimes do, where they love yeah. a chattel mortgage over a vehicle. So, like I was thinking about that, is that like something similar to like a chattel mortgage over a vehicle, where the where the vehicle is recorded in our in a registry of records that the vehicle actually belongs to the bank until um, the customer would have repaid the loan in full. Is that something similar to that? Yeah, similar to it. Yeah, similar to it. Yeah, or a boat or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you know that there are three types of mortgages. Legal mortgage, an equitable mortgage, and then you have an equitable charge. So anything tangible? Yeah. Okay. So a legal mortgage may be either one of the following. A lease, where the mortgager grants to the mortgagee a lease of the land. That one is very rarely used. Or a legal charge, where the mortgager charges his land to the mortgagee by deed. So a legal mortgage by charge is the same as a mortgage over land. And it gives the mortgagee the rights and the powers in law, including the power of sale. The mortgage or grants a charge to the mortgagee over his land by way of a legal mortgage, which is typically granted by deed. Now, and then you have the equitable mortgage. They could be created in different ways. To be an agreement, the borrower may agree with the mortgagee to execute a legal mortgage if required to do so. So normally there's a provision saying that they will create a legal document. Or you could have deposit of the title deeds. Remember, if the title deeds are for safekeeping, they do not create a legal mortgage. Now, so how is it done? The mortgagee and the mortgagor execute a document that is known as a memorandum of deposit, which the mortgagor signs. And the key thing about it is once he signed, he evidences his intention to create an equitable mortgage only and the terms of the arrangement with the mortgage. The memorandum of deposit may contain an undertaking to create a legal mortgage if necessary. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, pertaining to the legal mortgage, um, I was interested in purchasing a, let's just say condo. Mm -hmm. And persons at the time were still in the prop was still in the building. They were renting from the owner, um, but the owner was selling it. They canceled um, anybody purchasing it because they say it's the legal right of the tenant to now purchase the prop, well, purchase the building if they wanted to. 
Mm -hmm. on a that's that's is that something where you're referring to as legal mortgage? No, 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 no. That means in the contract that they signed with the owner to rent, there mm. was a provision in the contract. Oh. It says that whenever the yes, whenever the the condo was up for sale, they give them right. the first right of refusal. Okay, okay, yeah. All right. So. You have a memorandum of deposit, and of course, it can contain an, an undertaking to create a legal mortgage if it is required. If the memorandum is in the form of a deed, it could include an irrevocable power of attorney, which would give the lender the power to sell or to appoint a receiver in the event of a default. Or it could declare the bank as mortgagee. Sorry, I have a question um, based on a statement you said prior to the statement you were making right then. You said that um, the memorandum of deposit can, mm -hmm. be can be converted into a legal mortgage if necessary. Yes. What Under what circumstances would that be? Like, why would I, if, if I already have... Um, this memorandum memorandum of deed. Why would I, why and what instance would I need to convert it to a legal mortgage? Mm. I'm thinking now. Okay, let's say you're a beneficiary of a trust, right? And you have agreed okay. that you want you 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 have an you have an equitable interest in all of the properties in the trust. You then arrange to get, you got the consent of the trustee and the protector to use one of the assets to get an equitable mortgage. So let's just say you got that at the age of 21. Okay. But in the, in the trustee, there's a provision that at the age of 25, you can actually get an advance. And then you ask the trustee to advance you or to give you that property outright. Okay. And so then you will have both legal and equitable interests. So you can convert it to a mortgage. Oh, okay. To a legal mortgage. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. Note that an equitable mortgage is only actionable if it is in writing and signed by both the borrower and the lender. So you have an equitable mortgage, you have the legal mortgage, and then you have the equitable charge. So in an equitable charge, the mortgager, in consideration of the loan, agrees in writing to allow a specified property to act as security for the loan. And the bank has to apply to the court for an order to sell the property in the event of a default. So it depends on what the asset is. A second mortgage, the banks still do second mortgages because I know they stopped some time back. You could probably have it on the, at the same facility, at the same oh. bank but not at I, different I, banks. Yeah, I think that, that's kind of rare and almost obsolete now. Yeah, second mortgages. But you know why? You know why, right? It's not used here. The way it should be used, especially for businesses, because we don't have registered land. Because these second mortgages would have been automatically attached right. to the property. And by not being I mean, able to risky too. but it would be only risky if you don't register but we know the some you know we, we've had a lot of instances where our properties aren't aren't being registered agreed that's what i'm saying if we had registered land the only risk you would have is if there is a default and the value of the land has dropped yeah that that's the risk you have to take there. Mm -hmm. So a mortgager may create a second or subsequent mortgage 
which will rank after the interest of the first mortgagee. Now remember now, it can only rank before the first, after the first, if the first is already registered. So what was happening in the past was that the second and the third were being registered before the first. So then they become the first. Then they, yes. And so when the first then decides to exercise their power of sale, they begin to find out that they're not first, they were third. Lord of mercy. And that's why you see a lot of banks do not do second mortgages here in the Bahamas. And people were just doing it everywhere. They go to every bank and get a mortgage on the same property. Now, if you have your mortgage at one bank, of course you can go for a second mortgage or like they say, a further charge using your equity of redemption because the bank is already holding the property. The bank knows the value of the property and depends on when you got the loan, they may ask you for an updated appraisal. And then they do a calculation just as if you were getting a fresh loan and looking to see what is your equity of redemption and what you can borrow. And to me, that's always a trap because it keeps these poor people paying these mortgages long, long, long years. And in some instances, by the time they finish, they've paid for their house twice. Three times. So well, sometimes depends yeah. on the interest rate. So people normally use their equity and redemption for security for further borrowing. So you see people use their equity when they want to send their kids off to school. They come and they borrow. And it's in some instances, it's be a very sad state, especially when the children say they're not coming back. And plus they're not repaying. <laughs> and then you see, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you a makeup story. I've actually seen people in the bank crying. And I know one of, one of, um, one of the, the customers, I had known her from school and she was, she was crying. She's in a couple of grades ahead of me. And I asked her what happened. And she said, the bank is going to sell a house. She works yeah. for government. And yeah, she that's said- That's a very common practice. That's a very common occurrence. Very common. Yeah. She said she'd put her son and her daughter in school. Her son first. The agreement was she'll continue paying the loans <laughs> and he would support her at school. No, he got married. Yep. And then he told her, I am not supporting her. I am not giving any money for any loan. I never asked oh. you to go to the bank to get a loan. What an ingredient. Eh? Wow. Yeah. And she was, she was literally in the bank standing up crying. She said, I'm retiring in two years. I won't even have a house to live in. I don't know where to turn. Mm -hmm. She got to go buy a son house and stay right there. He doesn't live here. <laughs> I'd make that trip. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? That's exactly what I said. I said, I think you need to pack your bags and just go to his doorstep. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and tell him. The wife, um, the wife won't have that. She put my son a box. <laughs> but yeah but it's, it's, it's a I know I know the quotas now are very high for um, lenders I know there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. but some yeah but sometimes you really have to think about it should I really give this person this loan now if the person keep arguing arguing I, I qualify qualify one the money then you give it to them but sometimes they don't be making good decisions yeah. at all mm -hmm. They just trying to make the quota at the time. Yeah, she just want to make the quota. Okay, yeah. let me give this one. Let me call this one up. Let me see what I can give them. Let me call the next one up. As long as they make their quota, they're fine. And these poor people are, are being buried in debt. Yep. And it's yeah. not good. But I think, I mean, in that part, it, it's twofold. Yeah, the bank is somewhat to blame, but the client is to blame too. Mm. In some instances, yeah. The fact that if you are doing financial planning, you need to let at least let them know what that is at stake. A lot of persons don't even break things down or explain it to the customer. They just exactly. 
Exactly. But agreed. In some instances, they are being explained. And what happens a lot of times is that, let's just say one institution turns down a customer, they will go to another one. Mm -hmm. Like they, so they won't stop and you would advise them, um, well, this is too much or X, Y, Z. And they, they get offended. Customers actually get offended if you tell them, well, you can't, you're not able to afford this or you're not be able to afford it. They get offended. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Yep, that's correct. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them do, they get very offended and they will go from bank to bank to bank until they get what they want. Yeah. yeah. I had a client the other day, her loan is, her mortgage is in default and she's trying to borrow money to pay for her daughter's tuition. Yep. And she has to find money to update the loan. And she's insisting, I talked, I talked to her, but she's insisting on getting it. And someone is willing to give it to her. Oh. So she's going to get it from one of those lenders. Um, she has, she's a government employee. So, oh, that's it. yep. Not only that, some banks are now, well, I ain't call no name, but they're taking more than the 45% that is required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That total that ratio is over 45. How, how are they doing that? Why? I don't know. I work for that bank, but I'm just saying like, we are supposed <laughs> yeah, but, to but, 45%, right? but they're taking more than that. People going home with $200 in their pocket. But that doesn't that make any time. sense. Less but the bank... That. The bank's money is secure, so I mean, I mean, it doesn't make it right, but that's how the bank justifies it, I guess. Yeah. So, what is going to happen? Let me ask you now. What is going to happen when the when the credit credit bureau comes on stream? How is that going to work? That's why yeah. it's important for that to come on stream. Yeah, yeah. I it's think not going to work. Needed. Yeah. But most people, from what I've seen, because I worked in collections for a couple of years. Um, they maxed out already. I mean, it wouldn't really make a difference now. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these people are maxed out. You don't have the banks now. You have like, you have little. Yeah, you, you know, have a lot of little lending. Pop -ups, offices, you know, know. Giving you money for, you know. Right. And because they're not, um, they are not being, um, they're not F F F FSI. They, those lending institutions, I don't think they are governed by the 45%. Who well, you mean, the lending institution? Yeah. No, I don't think, no, they wouldn't no, be. I don't no, think so. that 45% is from Central Bank. Right. The lending, they fall under the commission. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, like, we, like I said earlier, if the banks don't give them, they go to them. So you really have to blame the customers in some cases and uh, plenty cases. Like they go, they want what they want. They desperate. And they're adults. I mean, they know how much they're going to be exactly. left with. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But, you, but, but I think some of them is they know they want it. Whether it's, whether it's um, due to embarrassment or they just want to show off as an ego thing. They know at the end of the day, mm -hmm. they have no idea how they're going to pay these bills. Right. Yeah, they know it. But I mean, do they really care? They should instant care. instant gratification. Listen, I had a customer tell me, say, um, dead man no pay bills. Exactly. And they don't mind leaving it. Mm -hmm. All you for know, someone else to take care of. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Someone tell me say she borrow till she die. Exactly. exactly. That's what? That's the yes, that's, that's the mentality of the people. What do you yeah, mean she'll borrow till she die? They'll they'll die in debt, basically. Yeah. Exactly. In debt. Debt. And leave it to yeah. for it. They don't care. There were customers who let me tell you how serious some customers are. They would know persons in their accounts department, <coughs> go to one financial financial institution, get a loan, go to another institution, get a loan with one deduction. So they will have, let's just say they go to two institutions and each each of them. Um, the deduction is five hundred dollars. They get their friend and the accounts department to stamp both, but they only could afford one. So months later, when one of the institutions found out that that the deductions aren't coming in on a consistent basis, that's when they find out that, hey, we have this deduction stamp for another institution, so we could only send you like every other month. Oh, but that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, they they. I've heard of that too. Go to links. Yeah, I've they never heard of that one. 
The worst part is um, some parents wait till their children are of age and they send them or bring them to the bank for them to get a loan. Oh, yeah. For them. I've seen that too. Yeah. What? That when they yeah. are masked, they will bring the yes. children. That's very they common. Awesome. Put the police academy. They bring oh, it. No. Yeah. No. no. Yeah. All the get married. They came up for that. Yeah. So that they, so that means that from a very young age, as soon as they start working, they've already learned how to always borrow. Yeah. Yep. yep. And he's like, oh, well, it's my mommy. I mean, what could I do? I said, I'm only informing you of the situation because if you get married or whatever the case is, where you will be, you know. Mm-hmm. And these like 18, 19 year olds. So yep. The bank. So how many of you read the article by um, the governor? This year on the credit bureau. I haven't read it. I didn't okay. read it in, in, in its um, entirety. Entirety. Okay. So he says up to 30% of Bahamian borrowers will have to struggle to get a loan when the credit bureau begins. Wow. That sounds low to me. It's going to say only 30. <laughs> that sounds very low. I'm 30. I thought, no, I mean, the it opposite. <laughs> I thought it should be lower than 30%. So listen now. So the so the um the chairman of the Clearing Banks Association said that close to a third confirming it could find their ability to access new credit is curtailed because past failures to disclose existing debts will come back to haunt them. So for the credit bureau, um the governor said will begin to issue its first reports at the start of 2021 second quarter. So that means it's going to start tomorrow. You'll be able to provide all commercial banks and other lenders with a complete picture of a potential borrower's history, including whether they already have too much debt and if they have defaulted on previous loans. He said Bahamians will no longer be able to bounce from one bank to the next hiding histories of missed payments as they go. The credit bureau would enable the industry to escape operating in dangerous waters where it does not possess a complete picture of a loan applicant's credit work, credit worthiness. Say close to one out of every three may be negatively impacted unless they mend their habits. So they are estimating between 20 to 30%, but it could be more. Because they say, yeah, they say 20 to 30 percent to them is a lot. They say the credit bureau will introduce things that the banks never had the ability to verify. Mm -hmm. So things like whether you pay your rent, your utility bills on time, all of that you'll be able to see now. And they said all all of these will be incorporated to one document. I think he's the governor's being very generous in that percentage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that if, you bring in, if you bring in utility bills and Rain. stuff, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry. Betty. Now remember now, remember now, he speaks from, he speaks from what the head of each one of the clearing banks tell him. And a lot of the head don't see what you see. And by the time it gets up to the to the That's managing true. director, he would have no clue. Looking at all those little box when 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 the client fill it out, even if he used to do that a long time ago, he doesn't remember that now. He has no idea. But this is gonna affect um, I mean the bank's ability to land. I mean banks gonna have to close down. But well, see that <laughs> but that's why I, I added exactly. this right here now because now you have to begin to think. Lord of mercy. Yes. So first you have them huge quotas you can't meet. And now the credit bureau is about to come out. Mm. So who is required to supply information will be the commercial banks, the insurance companies, the credit unions, the financial and corporate service providers, the mortgage corp, Bahamas Development Bank. And then they're gonna add in the future, all the utilities, the auto dealers, the furniture stores. E- <laughs> Who laughing, man? Sorry, even the sorry. Gulf, 
even the government revenue agencies. So that means VAT, real property tax, everything will come full circle, like in other countries. Mm. Again, information from the Landlord Association. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did say rent, all okay. of that, utilities, all of that is coming. But how accurate is inf information? I mean, sometimes, anyhow, I just yeah, try. That's, <laughs> that's a good point. But you gotta depend on the accuracy of those records. That's why you have to keep on top of your, your business now. You know? Yes. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, but this is this is what I know there'll be some hiccups in the middle. I mean, like like someone may come to you and then you may say your score is whatever it is, and you try to figure it out, and then they say, Oh no, I paid that. It'll it'll be like when people pay their fines. You pay it and then the mm -hmm. police stop you again. Mm -hmm. so you have to pay it twice. But when you know when you pay it twice, you learn the lesson, you say, I'm keeping my receipt on me. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you paid three and four times. Mm -hmm. So this is what this is what's gonna happen here because you're gonna have to keep your receipts. I'll tell you one thing my son said last month in Canada. He said, Mommy, my credit score um change. I said, what happened to it? He said it's bad. I said, well, how could it be bad? What did you use your card? What happened? What happened? His payment was due, say the 17th. And he paid it on the 18th, the month before. His what? score went, I don't know where it went, oh, the sky. I said, but you paid it the next day. It didn't matter. If it didn't hit on the day it's supposed to hit, your score changed automatically. And there's nothing you could do until the next month. Oh my God. So they don't have grace days? No. Oh my God. Wow. That's crazy. No. And guess what? If you're applying for a job, they have to check your credit score. Yeah, everything. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. The only yep. plus side, what I foresee with the credit bureau is the interest rate. So I think, and, and they're saying that the interest rate. So lending interest rates is going to be based on your score, right? So for those yes. who always have good credit, that should be good news for them. Like, you know, their credit should be, I mean, the interest rates, if it is to go and get a loan, should be lower than they would have if, you know, if they, it wasn't in place. Because, you know, it was interest, the interest rates are straight across the board, whether you are good um, pay or, or not. Yeah, because I know for, for him, he just came out of school. So when he went to get a car loan, he was able to qualify for a $25,000 car without a job. Oh, wow. <laughs> that happened. Every, yeah, everything was based on his credit score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking they should do that, yeah, but she Yeah. Don't no, but don't forget now, he would have he provided a copy of his statement where I would send his money for his rent and his groceries or whatever. Based upon that, over the years he's been in school, they gave yeah. him a car loan, just like that. Wow. In three hours, <laughs> he drove off. Happening. He drove off in the car. So with a credit bureau, I think a lot of people who've had exposure in other countries They'll probably be expecting the same thing. If my score is good, why why do I need a long turnaround time? Right. These yeah. things should be instant. Yeah. After we've gotten rid of all the hiccups. So Gowan Bo, who is overseeing the credit bureau, said that the governor, um timeline for, for this credit bureau implementation is too optimistic. He said, say what? He's at our bank. <laughs> oh, yeah. He said, he added that when the sample report and information gathering would begin, I see say, I think it is what is intended is that the form and format of the report is expected in the second quarter, not the information itself on the clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said the timeline is not being used as the final credit report for any individual. So what he is saying, he's clarifying and saying that in the second quarter, we'll only just be looking at the, the format and the form, not actually getting a, an actual report on an individual. So 
Brathwaite, who is the chairman of the of the C of the Claren Banks Association, is saying that consumers and commercial banks need time to adjust to the new environment. But they had many time. They had years. Remember the central bank gave out a flyer almost five or six years ago? Mm -hmm. Saying yeah. that the credit yep. bureau was I coming. Remember that. Right. So he just came back from what, wherever island he was before in the Caribbean. So he's not aware that they, they, they know. They don't need any more time. They had almost five years to get their house in order. Mm -hmm. So he's also made a point of saying that he think the credit bureau would be a good boost, especially for unsecured credit, which is true. Yeah. The bank should be able to give unsecured credit based upon your credit rating. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you so understand understand what we just finished saying now, and look at where you were saying the competition was. These little small little lending places where people go, you can now you should be able to get that from your commercial bank. Agreed. If you have a good credit rating, you don't have to go to one of those little small places. The bank should be able to be given five thousand, seven thousand, ten thousand dollar, fifteen thousand. I don't know what limit they'll go to without any collateral at all. So he says here, both of them said that Bohemians will, with good credit scores, will benefit from having greater access to lower price loans that their counterparts were regularly defaulted on missed payments. So you should be getting better rates and better access to, to, to funds. I agree with that. Right, so they say persons with good credit ratings are going to love it. And those persons that have challenges throughout the industry, um, they're not going to like it. And they're gonna find it difficult for, fi for getting financing. But if you have a good rating, then you won't have a problem. But on the flip side of that, from the banks and the regulatory standpoint is, the banks said they've been taking on too many risky loans. The client's always lying, telling all kinds of stories. Never can pay their loan. Then afterwards, you can't find them anymore. They just disappear. And then the impact of the pandemic, I mean, that's going to affect even more people because, I don't know, they're not going to consider that you lost your job because of the pandemic. That's why you're behind. Well, know. that's another thing. Yeah, that's another thing too. Because I think a lot of people are complaining now that the banks are calling for their money and they're still not working. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know a year has gone by, but where am I going to get the money from? If that's I'm still what, waiting on handouts to eat. Mm -hmm. That's why they say don't wait for the bank to call you. You have to call them as well too. Uh, banks, yeah. have been, banks have been working with clients, but yeah. at some point, you yeah. know, they will you, follow through process. It's, yeah. yeah, you know, I work in collections, and it's tough decisions, tough conversations every day. Mm -hmm. and the bank has been but, doing quarrels and holding matters in abeyance, but for how long? Yeah. Yep. So, so, so that's another question. Now, this is a pandemic. This is worldwide. Do you think mm -hmm. that the banks then will just make a decision to foreclose on these homes? Well, decisions are being made. If the client situation hasn't turned around, if they're not paying, they've gotten the six months of deferrals. Um, that's that's inevitable. I mean, yeah, and but then, how can I pay if I don't have a job? Well, I, I, mean, I, I hear you. I hear you. And, but the thing is, I guess you have to accept that your circumstances have changed, and you can no longer afford this house. So if I've been, my mortgage, I say my mortgage is 25 years. I've been paying, I'm at my 18th year now. You mean I'm going to lose my house? If you can't pay, that's, that's the direction it's going in. But yeah, I mean, because I mean, the banks have given persons um, the opportunity to, um, say, lessen their payments or, I mean, they've worked with a yeah. lot of people for X yeah. amount of, this has been over a year now. But I mean, yeah. you have to think of it. How is the bank going to make their money? We didn't yeah. lend this money. Out. We understand your circumstances, but we also in a bind as well, too. Yeah. So I don't know. Like she said, decisions have been made. Uh, they're in agreement, so, uh, and, you know, they're talking about certain things. But 
when they will ask we don't know and i think too um, it's they, they it's on a case by case basis like mm -hmm. some persons are going to work they are working like shorter days or they found something that they can um um, let's make smaller payments, but the key is to come in and have the conversation with the banker. So you can let them know that, hey, I, I haven't right. forgotten. I am here. I, I, the most I can do, like come in and make, you know, just say, um, I can only afford $50 a week. They can be structured mm -hmm. alone. That's something that the bank can work with yeah. rather than and like ducking, ducking the bankers or, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what the bankers don't like. A lot of customers, they're afraid. So they duck bankers. Right. Mm -hmm. And those conversations are recorded actually. So if some you have the collections persons dealing with you, they would basically put that on your account so that if anyone was to go there, they can see, that, okay, I had a conversation with Mrs. Smith and she's agreed to do this or whatever. So they'd be leaning leaning into on those particular persons. Mm -hmm. mm. And banks have been restructuring loans for longer terms, you know, to come, you know, to uh, you know, to achieve a lower payment. But of course, it's depending on, you know, whether you have some consistent income, you know, to support a reasonable payment, you know, banks have been restructuring over 30 years up to age 80 in some cases, you know, that's long. Yeah. But, yeah. But, what could you, but what could so, you do? Yeah. You only work for the institutions now. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know that's how you get your salary because if you don't do it. <laughs> Listen, they don't, they treat us just as bad. I mean, let me don't say it like that, but you know what I mean. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. They're, they're more strict on us. <laughs> if you... Yeah, always treat us just like Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess you know the government has already borrowed or used up a lot of NIB's money. Oh yeah. 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 Definitely. So we're, we're in a really, really tight spot. Mm hmm mm hmm It's sad, but true. Yep. So if, so if someone was to call now and say that their non-payment or their financial hardship is related to the COVID-19 pandemic, what do you say? Well, we get information, you know, um, um, you know, find out whether the, let's say, if they're expecting to return on their job, depending on where that was, if not, are they seeking new employment? Um, do they have any, you know, any funds, any family assistance, you know, to help with payments? Um, but we've been, like I said, um, my bank has been, we've done deferrals, payment deferrals, um, and we are open to restructuring loans where there's some payments, you know, some payment that can be made, a reasonable payment to cover principal interest and homeowners insurance. Um, we've given clients a period where we just kind of hold out. Let's say if today, okay, it's, it's April 1st tomorrow. Let's say they're expecting to return to work in July. We may hold off from any action until then, right? And yeah. it depends, like, like, like someone said, we look at it on a case by case basis. So we've been, we've been leaning, we've been trying to work with the clients as much as possible and give them some time to get back. But if things don't turn around and we're at six months later, then the bank has to make, you know, some decisions. Hard decisions. They've waived some payments as well too. Yeah, they did the payment deferrals for up to six months. And in some cases we've still held off. Um, you know, yeah. anticipating that the person will return to work soon. We have a lot of Atlantis employees. Some of them are still waiting, but it's been a year and there's some of them are still waiting. Um, if they're not paying at some point, you know, we, we, have, we have to move on. Oh, but, but the that's... door is always open if things turn around. The, the door is always open to restructure the loan once they can maintain, you know, a reasonable payment. Because you know? a bank don't really want to have to take your house and resell it. They want their money. Exactly. I know. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's more energy yeah. for them to actually take it and resell it. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Because some of those properties sit on the market for years. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Even chattels for the cars, they don't want to take them, you know? Yeah, because I mean, I don't, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. So when you think the coronavirus will end? <laughs> it's going to be around for a while. Yeah, it's going to be around like for a while. A, a flu yeah. shot every year. Just learn to live with it, you know? 
Mm. Mm, I see. Well, some predict it's going to be the second quarter of this year. But this year. In, yeah, this oh, year, yeah. 2021. Mm -mm. The I Europeans can't. saying the second or the third quarter that of this year. Well, yeah. they don't foresee that. Wave. Some people that some countries in their third wave by now. That's what I I say. Why? Those countries saying that because they harden on millions of doses of vaccine. So yeah, they'll work out that'll work out for them in the third and fourth quarter because by that time, probably eighty to ninety percent of their population will be vaccine. But what happened to the other countries that are not say G five, G ten countries like us? Who's still waiting on the little leftovers or scraps of vaccine? Mm. <laughs> right. Like. So they're saying, but not only that, what? when you Go take ahead. these vaccinations, you have to build up an immunity to it. So it's not where I just take a the vaccine and then I could go be, you know, all free or whatever the case is. So I believe it can be here for a very long time. It, it, just like how you have the um, the flu shot, you, we might actually have to do that. I uh, speaking to a doctor, and that's what they might, you know, that's what they were saying. I don't know. What, get the flu shot instead? No, meaning that how we get the flu shot per year for the flu, we might have to get a uh, shot each year for this. I don't know. For like COVID 19 and for the flu? Mm -hmm, yeah. Wow. We don't know. People ain't doing what they do on period. They, and I mean, Granted, it's been here for over a year and you get tired and you get kind of relaxed, but you see people going on the island and partying and they ain't wearing no mask. They ain't social nope, distancing. they're not. No. So, no, once, once, once they, they said that a certain age range is, is, is um, not immune, but they don't, they're not, trans, they're, they're transmitting it, but they're not getting sick. Right. They don't wear any mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what they're saying is that the vaccine is working, the rollout is improving, and more vaccines are coming. And they think that this is going to, I guess, end very soon. New cases and deaths are lower, still high in some places. The only thing they're worried about is the infectious variants of concern. Mm. And so they can make it mandatory for that you do take the vaccination. I, I mean, I don't know. I will if he's still on that subject. So yeah, but I think they probably will. Will what? Because it doesn't mandatory? stop it, but make certain things mandatory from even like yeah. traveling, yeah. or they might even implement it in the schools now. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? For the children to go to uh -huh. school. That may be likely. Yeah. Actually, I saw a form. I can't remember what school it was, but they were saying that if it was to come to the school, would um, you give approval for them to give it to the child? And the parent on, on the form say, hell no, no, no. <laughs> ah, yeah, because you know, even in the States, they don't do vaccinations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, mm. Um, yeah. So think about that and mortgages and the COVID-19. Now, my next topic is the, what do they call this legislation? The Homeowners Protection Act. Any of you read it? You know what it's about? Yes, yeah, somewhat. Okay, let me hear what you have to say. Just a highlight. Um, well, it's, it basically protects the homeowner in terms of foreclosure. Um, I know a little bit about it, like in terms of, of once it reaches 90 days of delinquency, um, the client usually gets a demand letter and they have a certain time once they're in receipt of it, um, they have a certain time period to apply to the court. Or I, I think it's a stay or to mm -hmm. like delay the proceedings of the bank proceeding with the foreclosure process. It also protects the client if, say for instance, there is a sale for the property, it can only be, it can, they have to sell it for market value. Um, I can't remember all other things. 
sales, but I know they can't sell it. They have to advertise it at market value. Um, I think they can only go to a certain, if they actually get a sale, the sale price has to be a certain value of the home, especially if they've been paying the mortgage. Say they had a 30 year, 25 year mortgage and they've been paying the mortgage for 18 years. It also protects the homeowner that they can sell it below a certain value because of the amount of money they've already invested into it. Um, what else? I think that's all I can remember at this time. Yeah, there's a long, there's a long list. So far, you, what you citing is from Section 11 of the Act on the various exercises on the conditions of the power of sale. So yes, they have to sell it at market value within six months from the date when the mortgagee issued the notice of default or they got vacant possession. And if a mortgagee shall disclose in a notice that in exercising the power of sale, the mortgage property may be sold at less than the market value. And in the event that it is sold at less than the market value, the mortgagee may pursue the mortgagor for the recovery of any sums remaining in the, on the mortgage debt after the said sale. And once they, in the event that the property is sold at less than the market value, the mortgagee may pursue the mortgage or for the recovery of any sums remaining on the mortgage debt after the sale. Ms. Okay. Arthur, even though that's true, right? How many of our homeowners you know they privy to this information? Because a lot of people don't know their rights. Um and because I'm sure, um, I'm sure sales happen where they do that they, that do happen, but because the homeowners don't own, don't owe their rights, I mean, don't know their rights, they have no remedy. I mean, when I say they don't have no remedy, they don't know, so they don't know to pursue. Agreed. But I keep telling you, ignorance is no excuse. I know. Oh, sorry. Go sorry. ahead. No, I know but when the letter of demand is issued, that's, you know, once a account hits, you know, between 60 and 90 days, it's spelled out or it's referenced in the demand letter to the client that they can, you know, that they can pursue um, the, you know, the remedies under the um, Homeowners on Protection Act. Now, I don't know how many people, I mean, I know people don't read, but the information is there. And once you get a demand letter, it should it should speak to that so that you can then look into it. I know okay. our clients. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was gonna give you an example of a, a movie yeah, I was watching today where uh-huh. this man he runs a he has a company, many companies. It's an old movie. And the he is dying. And he had four wives, a personal assistant, um, a chairman, vice chairman of the board, and some other people there. And the doctor was there. He had asked his um, driver to call the lady who cleans his office every morning. And he asked, he said, why, does she, why, why do you think he wants to see you? She said, oh, I don't know. We always have good conversation about the old days. So they pick her up. They brought her to the house. Then they told her that she couldn't see him because the doctor said he cannot have any visitors. He's weak. So she said, but I'm already here. So she turned to leave and he came on top of the stairs and he said, I am, he said, I'm here, let her up. So she came upstairs, she sat with him. He pulled out this game, I guess they used to play when they were small and he was there laughing and he told her, give her, go, get him a, a shot of, of brandy. He asked for his cigar. She said, you cannot, you cannot smoke. She said, you're too sick. So he said, will you come and see me tomorrow? And he said, she said, yes, I'll see you tomorrow. So she left. He got out of the bed as sick as he was, went to his bureau, got some more brandy, put it in the cup, drank it, and then pulled out his cigar, lit it, took one puff and dropped down there. So he was buried the next day. There they are reading the will. He left everything. 
to that woman who cleaned his office. Everything. Wow. All his company, everything is worth $10 million. When they were finished reading the will, she said, I don't understand a word that you said. They said, what do you mean? She said, I don't know what you mean. $10 million, how much money is that? She said that the, 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 the most money I've ever had in my hand was 45 pounds. What is 10 million? How much is it? Then they came down, they said, you have to elect a new chairman tomorrow to run. She said, what is the chairman? What do I do? Wow. So I say all that to tell you is that yes, it's written there, the law is there, but people don't understand it. And for them to understand it, they'll have to pay a lawyer to interpret it for them. Yep. And they don't have the money for that either. And if you look at the average grade level, I don't think your children can help them either. Wow. That's why I kind of so asked you what you meant when you said that because you say exercise their right basically, but you don't have the money to do that. Yeah. 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 So it's understanding it and then knowing whether you wish to exercise your right. And that's why a lot of people's homes are taken. So sometimes when they meet someone who is a lawyer, they'll say, this is what happened to me, but it's too late. Because everything is a process. But Ms. Archer, a question in terms of the Homeowners Protection Act, mm -hmm. if it's based on if your, your mortgage was in default after the act was passed or prior to so if you were delinquent, say, I think it was in 2017, so say if your mortgage was delinquent from 2016, 2015, does that act? Because I don't think I forget the legal term. I don't know if it proceeds. I don't know the term that they use, but it like it backdates. I don't know. That's not the word that they I use. No, I don't think it's retroactive. Retroactive. No. I think the bank would have had to commence some um, um, proceedings. On plenty. As of, I think it was March 31st, 2017. 18, yeah. 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 And then what I realized too from working in, because I worked in collections as well, um, there is a process and some of these things don't happen overnight. Because I remember like there was a situation, I, I think it was the mortgage call where they were foreclosing on person's home and getting them evicted and stuff like that. But I uh -huh. remember they made a statement and said, like, these people didn't just fall delinquent like two years ago, last year. These people haven't paid anything on these mortgages for years. So it isn't, it isn't like we're just coming after them like a, you know, a, like a bull racing after people in the street. It's like there is a process. And of course, we know the car system is a little backed up as well. Um, so it is a process. And there is a chance, like, there is a chance for you to, you know, once you get your financial situation back in order for you to try and rectify the situation. So it isn't like sometimes banks just, you know, aggressively pursuing these people, you know, they give them chances to get your home back. And then like you say, they're actually in these homes, you know, mm -hmm. they're still living in these homes, not paying or paying once every three months or once a year, you know, but there is a process. So in terms of them actually, quote unquote, losing their homes, they're actually being evicted out of the home. That means they the bank has already gone to court. They've already gone to court. Um, the court gives them so much time to, ev to evict the, prom the premises. So it like this is a whole process. It isn't like all this stuff happens in one year or two years. There is a process. And customers do have chances to, I guess, get in better standards. Like the lady said, they can get their loan rewritten or restructured once they can make those consistent payments. Yeah. You notice there is a prohibition in this legislation, right? No. So... Yes, when the mortgagee exercises his power of sale, it, it cannot sell the mortgage property to um, an employee of the financial institution or a director. They cannot sell it to an immediate family member of a director or employee of the financial institution. 
They can't sell it to a company beneficially owned by an employee or director of the financial institution. And they can't sell it to any person who by the nature of the intimate relationship with the director of employee of the financial institution will be given a more favorable consideration. Unless the mortgagee agrees to it, eh? Um, let me see. That, that, that clause is not here. Mm. I know we were no. doing that as well too, but it's once the mortgagee agrees to it that they can um, sell to an employee or whoever, um, we could go forward with it. Mm, no, it doesn't say that here. Okay. Was, was that in the original contract? Uh, that might just be something that we personally did. I don't know. I don't think I'm yeah. not. Yeah. Because that, immediate family means the spouse, the children, the parents, the siblings, and cousins. Right. So I could, I could see it being done if it was in the original contract. But if it's not in the original contract, then you'd be contravening the provisions of this of this act. Okay. What else is saying? Exemption from stamp duty. A mortgager may not more than twice in any year request in writing. A mortgage statement. And the bank has 30 days to produce it. Mortgage statement? Mm-hmm. So do they go through legal channels for that or like? No, the law yeah. gives them the right. Okay. Yeah, the law says they have a right to get it, not more than twice a year in writing. And you furnish them with it without any charge. You cannot charge oh. them a fee. You have to give them the principal the interest in any other costs and fees owing. Okay. And the mortgager also has a right to choose the attorney they want and the appraiser. Because I know most organizations have their own list. Mm -hmm. Right. So they say you could retain whatever counsel you want, or you could choose from a list mm -hmm. approved by the mortgagee. And the same for an appraiser. Right. Yeah. And every mortgagee should publish on their website or put it in a newspaper a list of the approved attorneys. Let me see some more, hold on, hold on. You know what they want to do a study grouping. Eh? Why are you only on to chapter three? <laughs> I gotta catch up. <laughs> Listen to this. There's a section in here, section 19. It says where mortgage or whose mortgage payments are deducted from his earnings by his employer, seeks to have his employer give effect to a request to facilitate a payment on his behalf that will result in the deduction from his earnings of a sum which when calculated together with his mortgage payment deduction results in the total deductions from his earnings exceeding in the aggregate such percentage of those earnings as may be prescribed by notice by the minister, the employer shall not give effect to such a request. What? <laughs> it says that if you have a mortgage deduction coming out, Mm -hmm. And then you're getting another, um, you want another deduction and it's going to actually cost whereby your total deduction is going to exceed mm -hmm. the percentage that's required. The employer cannot sign that form. Okay. A lot of people need to read this.
So Ms. Archer, does this really protect the homeowner, the act, in your opinion? Well, if you don't if you don't catch it by the number of days, you are fresh out of luck. Everything goes by days. This is only delayed inevitable most. Yeah. Yeah, just giving them days. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Okay, let's say, let's say you got the notice that they're going to sell the property. So within 10 days of the notice, the mortgager may issue a notice of objection. So you say, okay, I object to you selling my house. Stating therein the intention of the mortgager within seven days. So within 10 days of the receipt of the notice, then you have to then state your intention within seven days. And your intention within seven days has to speak to how you're going to pay the amount of the principal and the interest that's accrued at a specified time. Then you're gonna say how you're gonna remedy any default. Mm -hmm. And then you could apply to the court for relief. So let's just say you didn't get the receipt of notice. Oh, no, you didn't give your receipt of notice to the bank. So within 10 days, after they've issued the notice of sale, the mortgagee shall within seven days advertise at least four times over a period of not less than 60 days in the newspaper or on their website. The property is now offered for sale. So prior to the mortgagee accepting an offer to purchase the mortgage property, the mortgagor may make an offer to purchase the mortgage property at market rate. So why would I want to now purchase my property well, you can't at, sure. at market rate? That doesn't make no sense. No, it doesn't. Prior to the mortgagee accepting an offer to purchase the mortgage property, so before the bank decides to accept an offer, I will make an offer to purchase the property at market rate. Why would I do that? Well, what if the, the mortgage balance is higher than the market value? You get it for a lower price. But, but you can't pay for it now. I know, but you, if you have an opportunity, let's say someone will help you buy it. Well, okay, okay, okay. And the market okay. value is 100000 and you still owe 250000 on it. You win. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, 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 I don't know. Then they say the mortgage fee shall add this option, accept the highest price offered for the sale of the property, even if the price is less than the market value. Then they apply it to the mortgage. So when the mortgagee sells the mortgage property for a sum higher than the mortgage debt, the mortgagee shall pay such remaining sums to the mortgagor or to whoever they, are, whoever they left their funds to if they died. Mm -hmm. So once the bank exercises its power of sale, um, that discharges the mortgage off from any and all liabilities for any sums under the mortgage. And that's only if the sum, what they got for the mortgage is equal to at least one half of the principal and accrued interest. Or the mortgage or has been in the occupation of the dwelling house for a period not less than 50% of the original mortgage term. This must be the catch 22 right here. Mm -hmm. Say for any surplus amounts referred to, the exercise by the mortgage of a power of sale shall discharge the mortgager from any and all liabilities for any sums due under the mortgage. If at the time of the sale, a sum equal to at least a half of the principal and accrued interest have been paid to the mortgagee. 
So you see the conditions? Mm -hmm. And the mortgage owner has been in occupation of the dwelling house for a period not less than 50% of the original mortgage term. Then the mortgagee will execute a deed of release. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's the provision. The provision of this section shall apply to all mortgages, notwithstanding any provision, any other law or custom or any clause contained in any mortgage document executed before or after the coming into operations of this act. And the next thing is a mortgagee, when they exercise their power of sale, they are not liable to the borrower for any claim or claims for loss or damage suffered by the borrower by reason of the sale. I don't see what the advantage is. It's just a bunch of steps. Exactly. Yeah, I don't see it. Only thing they're really giving you is notice. Mm -hmm. And time to pack up your stuff and get out. Yeah. So I think I think the whole purpose of this, even if I say something else from a political standpoint, the whole purpose of this was just to give you a more refined process mm -hmm. when the bank exercises the power of sale. Because you know, some people were claiming that. They weren't aware. They didn't know. So they have what they put in here is the various steps that the bank must go through. And then also for the borrower to make a claim and say they want a matter stay, that they're going to find an arrangement or they have the monies to pay for it. Mm -hmm. That's all this is. Because I agree with you. If they can't pay for it now, they can't pay for it tomorrow. Unless, of course, someone died and leave them a win for. Yeah, if they find one job in that six month period, you know, we may, we could restructure. Well, that's true too. Mm -hmm. It says here when, where, where a mortgager receives notice in accordance with section four, the mortgager or member of his immediate family who has been contributing to the payment of the mortgage prior to the breach could apply to the court for relief. And that relief means they could adjourn the proceedings. Mm -hmm. They could give a judgment. They could stay or suspend the execution of the judgment order. They could postpone the date for delivery of possession up to six months. So again, it's giving you more time. And racking up legal fees. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And then you could also apply to the court to postpone the sale. And then how, how do you approve? Because I have a case right now, anyway. But where this this woman, you know, this woman has been struggling all this time, and you know, we're, we're now about to move to the legal action, and um, they're bringing in they're bringing in one of their children to help out. But I think that says if the child was helping out prior to the default. Yeah. I mean, they really weren't, but I guess, I guess you can. You, really. you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah, they can. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad just to see that though, you know, and so some of these kids could step, step up, you know. There's a lot of that, children at home and not contributing. I agree with you. But you know, the issue comes then that, guess what? I'm contributing, right? There are four of us in the house, excluding mommy, and I'm contributing. But then when mommy writes a will, she leaves it to one of them. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So that's what a lot of people, they normally ask that question normally when I do classes. 
and especially when I do the, the, the banking law classes, they always ask that question. Mm -hmm. And they say, what if I'm contributing and on the mortgage, I, I give mommy the money for the mortgage. And then she writes a will and she leaves it to someone else. Well, unless you have the receipts to show where you paid it yourself, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you just, you just have to argue. I don't know. It'll be up to the judge. Well, I mean, if the, if the mother left it for uh, one of her children, how are you, I mean, you were paying, those payments were to maintain the roof over your head, but how? People don't think like that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, you either pay or go find somebody to live. Yeah, but all the rest were not paying and one of them got it. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> but that's why a lot of children don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, unless it is transferred in my name, I'm not yeah. doing it. Yeah. And one can blame them. Somebody who, um, who actually bought them. You see? So that's something else you have to look at. Mm -hmm. So even when you see, even when you see, um, like she was saying, the client is coming in with their children or their child. Mm -hmm. That's something that they have to take. They, you really need to ask them to seek legal advice. Yeah, I have and they have. Yeah. And they're putting something in, in, in place. Okay, good. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it'll be a very sad story. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it did, and then I see another thing what this does is you have more time and it's a process you have to follow. But let's just say, once you're in breach, the law states that for the mortgagee, the mortgagee cannot exercise the power of sale unless they have served the mortgagor personally or by registered post. Mm -hmm. at least 30 days before the written notice of the intention to exercise the power of sale. Now, say personally, mm. is one thing. Registered post, I don't know about that one. Mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't work. Speaking yeah. from, that doesn't work because a lot of the mail gets returned. <laughs> because what if I had the mortgage for like 10, 15 years and I don't have the PO box no more? Or it was the general delivery. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah, thing. but uh, and that's the thing. I mean, yeah. So even that needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Registered posts don't work. No, and to serve some of these people, they be ducking and dodging. Of yeah. course. Hmm. Because you have to serve them personally or by registered post. Hmm. So, so let's just say if you, you serve them, right? The mortgage or, or member of their immediate family who've been contributing may within 28 days, they can make an application to the co-op. to postpone the sale, 28 days. So that's really all this is. It's just you're notified and then they give you the whole process for the power of sale involving you in it. It gives you another final opportunity to make good. And that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't protect you no other way. There's no savior coming. Mm -hmm. None whatsoever. All right. As I told you, it's a short one. We're done. I don't see you all until what? A month's time? A month? Yes, yeah, check your schedule. Yeah, because um, you have the other lecture, right? Yes. Okay. That's Glenn Knowledge. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you have Glenn. Yeah. I had a question. I didn't know if this was saying they, it does or it doesn't, but it says um, 
this would have been last week. It should be noted that the VAT rules do allow purchasers or don't allow purchasers as a VAT registrant to claim their VAT payment as an input credit if the property is exempt from the payment of VAT as well. What page so you want? Page 23. Mid, yes, mid I was on 24. Okay, where? Midway? Yeah, it should be noted. It should be note. You see that? One, two, three, four, fifth paragraph. It should be, yeah, it should be noted that the VAT rules do allow a purchaser. They do. As a, do allow a VAT purchaser as a VAT registrant. But hold on. Do you know that the VAT rules? Do not, do not. That's what I was wondering. Yes, do not. I think I remember you said do not, but it says do. Yes, it's do not. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's do not. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so I'll see you all in a month's time. Okay. Dr. Archer, I mean, Mrs. Archer? Mm -hmm. Okay, before you go, I missed the first two classes, so I just need to go to YouTube and and then what, read the first four modules to be up to speed? Yes, yes. Okay. Send a, send, send, send a um, email to Miguel so he can give you the link. Oh, yeah, he sent it already. So I'll- Okay, I'll all right. So just use that. And if you have any questions, then you could just let me know. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Oh, good night. Okay. Says, are you straight? You good? Yeah. Good night. Okay. Good night, Good night. Good night. Take care. Good night. Hold on, she missed classes and she's saying she's straight. Oh, she she's gonna listen to the video first Not and even. then she'll come back. What the number is? I have to call you. For me? The lecturer. Or you? 2372. Say it again. 805-2372. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. All right. Bye. All right. My dad's saying, Charlotte, will they take up the road and no electricity? He's saying, Good morning.